Um, our first speaker is uh, Professor Jim Hayward, uh, Emeritus Professor in the Biology Department. He's been working for many years with the Seabird Ecology team, and he has a long list of student advisees that have co-published with him and have gone on to greatness. So, Jim Hayward. Well, I didn't know I was going to have to demonstrate that I was worthy of this honor, but I do appreciate the opportunity of doing that, and I hope that, uh, that, that we, we are worthy of that. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, something of great interest to me, um, and we're going to look at um, the history of Washington. And you may wonder why that's the case, but uh, hopefully you'll see that as we go on here. Let's see, how do we put this forward? There we go. Nope, I put it off. There we go. First, I want to thank uh, a variety of uh, people who have, and institutions that have helped us. Uh, obviously, the Andrews University Office of uh, Research and, and uh, Creative Scholarship, uh, both uh, Gary and Sarah have been great to work with during our uh, work here at Andrews. Roy Jensen and Bob Cushman. I'm actually going to be talking about geology today, not seabirds. And we're, I'm not a geologist. Shondell's not a geologist. So we kind of took on a couple of geologists to help us with this project. We're very excited about it, but uh, we're not, whoops, we're not uh, actually geologists. We've got an interest in it. Hart Krauser is uh, where uh, Roy Jensen works, and they are supplying some of the uh, work that we need. It's a, it's a consulting firm in Seattle, geologic consulting firm, Walla Walla University, where Bob Cushman is the uh, academic vice president. He's also a geologist. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which allows us to work where we work, and uh, Ross Anderson, who you've pictured here, who's a Pulitzer Prize-winning author who is our skipper, who takes us back and forth when we're doing this work, because our boat is in dry dock during the winter when we have to do this work. Well, most of you know where Washington is. This is the state of Washington. Why am I talking about Washington? Uh, I was actually born and raised in New England, and uh, it seems odd that I'd be talking about Washington, but I've actually spent uh, 37 of my 67 summers in Washington State in about five full years. So in a sense, I'm an adopted uh, son, I guess, of Washington. I kind of take it as that. It's a beautiful state um, that uh, has, has an awful lot uh, to, 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 to go for, to see. So I'd like to first start out by talking about Washington state history writ large, really large. And then I'm going to bring it down to a project which is a very tiny slice of that history and give you an idea of the types of things that we think about. First of all, let's look at uh, habitat diversity. That's what I'm interested in as a biologist. And um, this is where biology seems to connect with geology. Actually, the two are very closely related. Here we see a geologic map of, map of Michigan. And you can see that there's kind of a nice order here. There's the strata are nicely stacked up with a little push in the center here. We call this the Michigan Basin. And we get these nice concentric circles, sort of looks like a bullseye here. Everything's kind of organized and neat. I want to show you Washington now. It is not that way, but it is because of that that we have the tremendous diversity of habitats in Washington. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Well, if we look at a cake here, this is like Michigan geology. This is like Washington <laughs> geology. But Shondell and I are sort of like our grandson here who just loved that messy cake that my daughter, who's an artist, made. Believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, it, there is so much diversity. It is just delicious state to, uh, to, to study. Oops, let's see. Here we go. OK, so just some of the diversity of Washington State. We have the coastline, um, which is beautiful. Then we have these rainforests, which we come in from the coastline. We see, and then we see the mountains. We have two beautiful uh, sets of mountains. And uh, we have the Olympic Peninsula, the mountains out there, and then we have the Cascade Mountains. And then we go to eastern Washington, and we have the dry desert 
land. So there's tremendous diversity. Because of the tremendous diversity, we have a lot of diversity of life, as you might expect. First, I want to talk about tectonics. Tectonics is the sh development of the shape of a, any particular locality. And uh, let's look at that. And in order to understand that, these days, we really have to understand something called plate tectonics. Plate tectonics, as you probably are aware, the world is broken up into these mainly 15 major or so major plates. And these plates are moving around on the surface of the Earth. And some of them are going down underneath other plates. Others are they're spreading centers and so on. OK, what I want you to notice is the, this is a huge plate here, the largest one, the Pacific plate. But there's a little one right up here that you'll see. And that's called the Juan de Fuca plate. And the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting underneath the, the west coast of Washington state and Oregon. And uh, it's that plate that's creating so much of the diversity that we're going to see. And this is subducting as we speak. OK, it's measurable. We know what's going under there. And as you can see here, this is the, um, there we go. This is the plate, or this is going under. It's subducting under. And what it's doing is it's creating a lot of friction there. Uh, and uh, we're getting uh, volcanic eruptions. We're getting mountains pushed up, as in the coastal range here. This is the Cascade Range. Oh, sorry, this is the Olympic Range. And this is the Cascade Range. And we have these active volcanoes. There's Mount Baker up here, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount uh, Adams, and so on. So there's a lot going on. What has happened is that belt has gone underneath. As the Juan de Fuca Plate has gone underneath, it has scraped off islands along the west coast of North America. And it's created these. They're called exotic terrains, and they come up and they're just like collisions, and they bang into one another, and you get this really complicated geology. It's a mess, frankly, in Washington to try to figure out where all these start and, begin and, and end and so on. So these are some of the belts that we talk about. Something else has happened in Washington as well, and that is there have been these giant fissures in the rocks. And because of that plate subducting down, we're getting a lot of melting lava. And those, that lava has come up and oozed out over vast areas of the state. This is actually Hawaii, but we think it probably looks something like this. And what we're seeing is this vast area, the Columbia Plateau, which is covered with basalt, which is really just hardened lava. And this huge, enormous area uh, is covered with uh, hundreds of square miles of, of basalt. The basalt is very deep. It's up to a mile, over a mile deep in places. So these are multiple flows that came out. And in addition to that, there's a soil zone that runs here. So we've got habitats that have developed between these, these um, uh, flows of lava. We also have explosive eruptions. This is Mount St. Helens erupting in 1980. I was in eastern Washington, 100 and so miles away, and I heard this blow up. And um, soon saw ash coming over. And I was studying a gull colony in eastern Washington on a lake there. And my entire gull colony, this is my PhD project, was covered with volcanic ash. And here I am at one of my study si uh, nests a year later, I came back, and we had preserved eggs and nests that we dug out of the ash. Very, very interesting. And this is what got me interested, in, one of the things that got me interested in geology. All right, so we've got these mountain building processes. We have volcanic eruptions. We also have glaciation evidence in Washington state. Two large ice sheets have come down, the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which covered parts of, or, or covered Michigan and down into Indiana and Ohio. To the west, we had the Cordillarian ice, ice Sheet, which um, came down to the northern part of Washington. It probably looks something like this. This is, an, this is a, uh, a picture of Greenland, where we still see an ice sheet. And so this is what it would have looked like. Something like this, coming down into Washington state from the north. What's impressive is this ice, how thick it was. The ice was a mile thick and more. And here you, just to give you an idea, I don't know if you've been to Seattle, but um, okay, this is about 3,000 feet of ice. It's a lot of weight. 
This is Seattle. You see the Space Needle there. If you've ever been to Seattle and known the Space Needle, you can imagine how high this ice was pressing down on the land. The land is still bouncing back from that, as is our land here. Measurable rates of bounce back. We call that glacial rebound. Uh, what this is supposed to show are scratches in the rocks. And um, we can tell that there were glaciers running across here because we can go to a modern glacier like Athabasco Glacier in, National, Na, glacier in Jasper National Park. We can see these scratches in the rocks, which are linear. And we have the same thing in Washington State. And that's what this is supposed to show you here. We also see these big glacial grooves in the rocks, which are characteristic of a glaciated area. We also see things like glacial erratics. Many of the big boulders we have on campus are actually glacial erratics, because our area here was also glaciated. See, these are all evidences of glaciation. So we're going to move on here. All right, the last major thing about uh, Washington that I want to uh, tell you about are these uh, mega floods. This is just fascinating. Shondell and I just came back from Washington here a few weeks ago, and we drove through and spent about three days looking at the evidence of these huge mega floods through Washington State. What do we mean by that? Well, what I want to point out here is this lake. This is an old lake called Lake Missoula. Lake Missoula is no longer there. If you've been to Missoula, Montana, you can actually see the old lake shores up on the hills around Missoula. They're quite prominent there, especially in the winter. Lake Missoula had about 500 cubic miles of water. That's a lot of water. And what's interesting is there was a dam right up here in the Purcell Trench lobe that held that water back. And repeatedly, that dam would dissolve or melt. And the water, there's the dam, the water would actually flow across eastern Washington. Well, you can imagine 500 cubic miles of water flowing all at once through the eastern part of a state like that and then out to the sea. We still can see the channels of this out at the edge of Washington state. Huge amounts of water, which in fact created what we call the channeled scablands of eastern Washington. This is an artist's rendition of what it might have looked like uh, you wouldn't have wanted to been in front of this. We're talking about 400 foot waves rushing through at 60 miles an hour down the state, wiping out basically everything in its uh, pathway. Uh, if you've been down the Columbia River Gorge, it actually went down the Columbia River Gorge, helped to dig that out, and so on. OK, one of the things that we um, uh, looked at, Shondell and I looked at, was the Moses Cooley. There are all these coolies that were dug out as a result of this, Potholes Cooley and uh, Grand Cooley. The, oh, I wanted to say something about this. That is a granite boulder that's way up on top of this coolie. That granite boulder came from way, way up north. The only way to get it there is to float it on ice, because it's so big. And so there were icebergs floating down this huge amount of water. And as it floated down, it carried these, uh, these granite boulders, which we now see scattered over eastern Washington. All right, uh, OK. This is the island I actually did my doctoral work on. It's uh, Harper Island in uh, uh, Sprague Lake in eastern Washington. And what you see are these potholes. And these potholes were formed by underwater volcanoes, which came and swept around like that and actually dug out, bored out these holes like this on uh, Harper Island and all across eastern Washington. Very interesting topography. We also see giant ripple marks. These are 300 feet long ripple marks. You can go out to the beach here in Lake Michigan and see little ripple marks about that big. These are 300 feet long. We also see old lake beds. This is from Nine Mile, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's uh, west of Missoula, Montana. We see the same thing just west of Walla Walla, uh, Washington. Uh, this is called uh, Burlingame uh, Canyon. All right, so let me bring you to what the specific work we've been doing. I've got to rush through that. 
So we're working up here in northwestern Washington on a little island called Protection Island. Um, the, uh, we study these uh, beautiful animals that live on the island. It's a great breeding site for these critters. Here are the people that uh, actually have been working with me on this project, um, Roy Jensen, Bob Cushman, and then Sean Dell. What you need to pay attention to is the uh, boundary line of the um, lobe of ice. And you can see how it came down. And if you look at where our island is located there in the red, you can see we're right at the margin. We're right where there was a split in the lobe. There was a Puget lobe going this way down the Puget, formed the Puget Sound. These are actually fjords, um, like we see in Norway and places like that. And then another lobe, the, Sand the Juan de Fuca lobe, which went out west. We're right at the point where it split. Here's the island. Looks like that. And we were curious about how it was shaped. It turns out the island was much bigger at one point, probably extended all the way up here. Now we call this Dallas Bank. And as we speak, this island is getting eroded back at about five feet a year or so. So in a few years, uh, longer than I'm been around, this island will be gone. And it will no longer be a place to uh, study the things that we're studying. But it used to be much bigger. So uh, what we're seeing is uh, sediment coming down from the island, forming these piles. The waves come along and form these. And then we get these uh, currents, which come along and drag the material out. Tide going out forms Canaan Point, which is one end of the island. Tide coming in forms Violet Point, which is another point coming down the other end of the island. What do the layers reveal? Well, uh, a whole bunch of things. And again, I don't know that you can see, but uh, just to give you some scale, this is the north edge of the island. This is Shondell and Bob standing out on the beach in the circle there. So we're talking about a fairly significant cliff, which is vertical, which is just what a geologist is looking for in terms of a uh, place to study. This is actually one of the best exposures of what we call Pleistocene strata in the whole state of Washington. But it hasn't been studied, so that's why we're looking at it. We've used a laser range finder to actually determine the, the widths of these uh, strata. And I'll just rush through here. We've taken points all along here. The island's about a mile, mile and a half long, half a mile wide to give you some scale here. We've come around the island, taken. Uh, we, we know what the strata are composed of. And we're in the process of making uh, what are called sections of the composition of these uh, various points along the island. Then we cinch these together and try to understand uh, what formed the island. Well, what do these processes reveal? Uh, what, do the, what do the layers reveal? Well, we've got a lot of peat formation down at the bottom, evidence of glacial advances, rhythmic sedimentation, cross bedding, which is a special form of uh, sedimentation, a dewatering, where we see these flame structures coming up, uh, earthquake activity, which forms these very interesting S-shaped uh, structures, faulting, uh, cutting and filling, and uh, glacial transport, and a whole bunch of other processes as well. There's many, many master's projects out here uh, for somebody to do. So what lived here long ago? Quickly, lots of things. Here's a whole conifer root system that's fossilized there on the beach we found one day. A conifer cone in the peat deposits. Chandel and I were walking along one day. We saw this structure, and it turned out to be the incisors of a giant beaver. This is the size of those things during the Pleistocene compared to a modern human. Uh, bison teeth from an old uh, bison. And um, we looked up one day and saw a shiny thing in the cliff. Sure enough, it was a tusk of a mammoth. And here you see some bone structures found there. And this is a woolly mammoth from that time. This is uh, uh, also a layer up on the side of the cliff. It's a bivalve layer, whole level, full of these uh, bivalves, which today we know uh, are existent today. So summary, quick, quickly. We've got colliding exotic terrains, which are cobbled together to form the state. 
Fissures repeatedly eject many layers of lava and cover to great depths the state of Washington. Multiple advances of the ice sheet scour northern Washington and the Puget Sound region. Then an ice dam repeatedly breaks and walls of water come down. Some people think it happened 40 times. So over that time, you get a tremendous amount of scouring. Uh, then we get a lot of sedimentation. The sediments then are carved out after these sediments rise up out of the water and Protection Island is carved out from the mainland. We can tell it's, we used to be connected because the strata are consistent with the mainland. Marine birds and mammals find Protection Island an ideal place to breed. We find it an ideal place to study these animals. And we became then curious about the sediment, sediments that form uh, this ideal breeding locality. And uh, our research is hopefully contributing then to an understanding of uh, Washington State and its history, even if it's a small, tiny slice of that history. Our motivation for this work is the same motivation that led John Muir to say what he did. When we try to pick anything out by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And indeed, that's exactly what we find. All the life that we study as a seabird ecology team is tied to the geology, and the geology is tied to on and on and on. So it goes back and back and back. A wonderful, uh, we have a wonderful world to study, and it's, uh, it's, it's great. Thank you very much.